The album was largely recorded in a studio in Brighton. There are parts of it recorded on, on my houseboat Astoria as well. And we've recorded at Air Studios an orchestra and we recorded a choir singing in a church in South London. The Liberty Choir are a choir run by a woman called MJ Paranzino who runs choir classes in prisons. The choir is made up of local people along with a few ex-prisoners from her programme inside the prisons. Rattle That Lock was inspired musically by the sound that's played on French railway stations uh, before they make an announcement. It's a jingle, a four, four note jingle that's played, uh, that every time I heard it, it would make me want to start dancing. I was in Aix-en-Provence station visiting friends. I heard it as you often do, so I then turned my iPhone on, held my iPhone up near the speaker and waited for the next announcement. Took that sample from that, that's what I've used. And, uh, and Polly has written lyrics, and her lyrics are inspired by book two of Paradise Lost by John Milton. It's about a journey, but it's also about that, the journey of not accepting the status quo. If it's based on two journeys, both inspired by Paradise Lost. In book two, Satan takes this incredibly heroic flight to go and sort out, I mean, it's God um, who's imposed the idea that there is no free will on him. Um, and in book 10, it's, it's the moment when Adam and Eve are expelled from Eden and told there are other versions of happiness. Whatever it takes to break, gotta do it. From the burning lake or the eastern gate, you'll get through it. More recently, we've brought other people in. I had Stevie Stanislaw, the drummer from my last tour, in playing on several other tracks, and Andy Newmark's played some as well, and Guy has played some bass on a couple of tracks. I think John's played electric piano on a track, um, and we've had Misha Paris and Louise Marshall singing on a couple of tracks. Today was one of the ones that Phil put together from um, two or three pieces of music of mine that I had sort of ignored. But he, he's very good at um, finding them and saying, that's great, you should use it. And how about using it with that piece and that piece? And so he mocked that one up. Yeah, it's a gift. Making an album is a lot of work, and um, sometimes the, the burden of that mountain in front of you it gets to be too much. And Phil is fantastically helpful at carrying that burden. He's like a mirror, you know, I bounce stuff back off him all the time, and um, he's full of enthusiasm and help. Great, okay, that's fine. Yeah. A Boat Lies Waiting. It's a piece of piano music that I wrote years and years ago, in fact. Um, I recorded it on a little mini-disc player, a horrible-sounding mini-disc player, 
when Gabriel, who is playing on any, any time, who is now 18, um, when he was a few months old, because you can hear him squeaking, squawking as a baby on it. In the process of recording, you want to make something that is of high quality, but you shouldn't be too scared of putting one or two elements in it that aren't of high quality, because they can, their quality can be lifted. And it's a mistake to lose that spontaneous moment. Polly wrote wonderful words that are sort of dedicated to Rick, really, to Rick Bright. They, they, they bring him to mind. Sometimes a song's moment doesn't arrive, and, and you have other ones that just at that moment have more completeness to them and, and have more meaning for the flow of what you think you are trying to create. It's like going into the sea. There's nothing. Something I never knew in silence I hear Girl in the Yellow Jess is a jazz track, which has been sort of trying to make its way to the top of the pile to be presented. Sometimes you write things and you can't quite find the way to finish them off and make them have the perfect fit for what you're doing. And this is a slightly unusual jazz track. I recorded it originally with a jazz trio here on this boat, but quite a long, a number of years ago. And I recorded it again at Abbey Road with a different bunch of people. And Jules was one of the people who uh, played it at Abbey Road. And Jules has come back and worked on it again for me more recently. He just, you know, it's perfect for his style of playing. It's, oh, yes, I know. But it's it just sounds, it sounds, it sounds, I just really like the sound of it. You can imagine, mm. you can see all the people playing it in the track. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Who's that playing that one? Um, the, it's Chris Lawrence playing bass, yeah. but it's got to my old friend Rado Closer from Cambridge, who was in the very early version of Pink Floyd, on it on guitar as well. She dances like a flame. Then the, 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 the other one goes down, yes. And the, 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 the sound. These things aren't planned in any way. They just present themselves, you know, in this um, way that it's, it feels pretentious to talk about, that tracks, you know, bits of music just present themselves to you or you feel like you've channeled them. But sometimes things just arrive and you don't know where or how they've come to you. And the way to go forward with this one was completely obvious. It was a jazz sort of track. Got brilliant words by Polly, who's um, managed in her usual way to hear in the music exactly what uh, is being suggested and being able to verbalize it and then lyricize it. Uh, Rob Wyatt has played the cornet on, on The Girl in the Yellow Dress, and um, an American sax player called Colin Stetson has played beautiful saxophone on that. You just take the easiest path forward and with, the, with the, the best people who you know and uh, you feel comfortable with and that uh, you think will 
understand the quickest what you're trying to get at. And it's completely different, um, to, uh, completely different to anything on this album and anything I've ever done before, I guess. But um, it's one of the best tracks on the album. I've written two lyrics on this. Polly has written five. Um, I don't find it easy writing the lyrics. The two lyrics on this one that I have written, the basic ideas for those lyrics presented themselves to me fairly easily. Um, I knew, again, they kind of suggested themselves, but um, the gaps between albums would stretch on for even more than 10 years if, um, if I had to do them all myself. Luckily, I live with and I'm married to a very good lyricist. David gives me the tracks and I, I actually, I, I walk in Brighton for miles and miles and miles with them in the headphones and, um, and start off by, he, he'll scatter melody. And often in this, it's quite interesting when you listen to the original scats, it's, they're like, it's like words are just trying to break through quite often. And there are, it'll always start with a line, so in any tongue. He almost sings, come in, I'll stay up. It's sort of, no, 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 no. And it's, it's sort of there, and so that was the first line that got written, and then I was sort of walking with it and thinking, well, who's saying to who? Home and done, it's just begun Here's hard ways more More than it ever did before Because I'm writing for David, it is an act of empathy. A lot of the time, you know, I'm particularly before this album, before I'd gotten on to the idea that I could write about people who were third parties, which was a fantastic revelation. It was when I wrote Girl in the Yellow Dress. I actually don't have to write what's inside David. I could just write what David might be observing. Previously, in the same way that I take a character on in a novel, it was like taking David on as a character and trying to kind of imagine what it is he might be trying to say or what it is he wants to sing about. My son Gable, who's uh, just about 18, is playing piano on one song called In Any Tongue. And his playing is absolutely beautiful and sensitive, and I thought that he would do a good job for me on this track. My old black Stratocaster, that's the one I probably use the most. great time working with Zbigniew for last time on, on an island, so I thought I'd ask him again. His sensitivity to my music, I, I think, is very, very strong, and he understands what I'm trying to do. And he wrote some beautiful pieces of um, orchestral music, which we recorded a few weeks ago at Air Studios. Um, it was a wonderful day, God. It's, it's really exhilarating to sit in a, in a big room with a 30-piece orchestra and, and record bits of music that you've written. Faces of Stone is really about my mother's declining years. Um, she had a sort of dementia and um, there was a particular moment, a particular day when we were walking together in a, in a park. And the opening line of the song came, comes directly out of that. As she was declining and she died um, less than a year, nine months, I think, after our youngest daughter, Romany, was born. So there's that thing of one life finishing and another one starting. Faces of stone. I've always been very keen on three, four time and waltzes. In fact, on an island was covered in waltzes. <laughs> They're rarer on this album. I sometimes think, should there be a more consistent flavor of music throughout an album, or 
is it okay to just take things that are sort of radically different to other things that they sit right next to. I figure that my voice and my guitar playing style creates the cohesion for an album and I don't need to worry about that sort of thing at all. Mm -hmm.